Welcome to Vancouver Real, another episode. We're getting near the dog days of summer here. My name is Mike Zaremba, and always with me is my big brother Andy. Hey, everybody. And Mr. Omid. Hello, everybody. And uh, we are obviously broadcasting here at a float house in, in downtown Vancouver at 70 West Cordova Street. Uh, visit floathouse.ca for any of your floating needs. And uh, we also have uh, Omid's um, YouTube channel we'd always like to endorse, which is Omega Point. So if you're looking for some inspirational videos, check out uh, Omega Point on YouTube. And we are on the verge, too, of uh, launching the Vancouver Real TV website and yeah. we're that's on its way it's almost gonna come we have the Instagram the Twitter the Facebook all set up ready to go so we're gonna do our full launch within the next uh, couple weeks for sure yeah exactly mm -hmm. so that way we'll have things more accessible and a little bit more uh, details associated with what this show is all about and today's show is all about Matthew Bennett who's Matthew Bennett you ask Matthew I met you maybe a month ago now uh, we just kind of connected. Matt is a local entrepreneur here in Vancouver with Active Solutions Medicine is your practice. And uh, Matt is a naturopath. You're a uh, athletic therapist. Are you a strength coach as well? Do you have your CSCS? I do not know. Oh, okay. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Oh, because you, you have it. So it's oh, I got it. I'll fill that void yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, anyways, Matt, welcome to Vancouver Real. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Mike. And uh, I'm looking forward to this next hour or so of uh, discussing health and everything that uh, we're bringing to Vancouver through this podcast. Cool. Definitely. Thanks, man. Well, Matt, I don't know what you've done to Mike exactly, but for the past like three weeks, Mike's just been like, oh, man, I met this guy. He's just like, he knows all this this stuff and he's treating me and he's you got to go see him. And he's kind of, he sold me on you before I even really knew what you did. Yeah. Like, well, well, I mean... Let's, let's start with like, okay, because you're one of those guys, when you get their business card or your email signature, it's Matthew Bennett, BSC, uh, ND, you know, and has all these acronyms after it. Why don't we go through, how about we go through the acronyms you have and maybe do with them in the order you got them and kind of take us through what brings you to today with Active Solutions Medicine. So the first title I received was my uh, athletic therapy degree from Sheridan in Oakville, Ontario. Right. Sheridan um, College. Yeah. It was in the first year, actually, of the graduating class of the degree. Oh, really? And so there was a quite interesting experience going through that process. Yeah. And athletic therapy, I'll kind of chime in, too, is like, it's, it's like, well, athletic therapists, they're similar to physiotherapists, um, but also different as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they're not as, and similar to occupational therapists, kind of, too. They're, they're, those three are kind of intertwined a little bit, but um, athletic therapists obviously work, you know, more exclusively with athletes and sports teams and stuff like that, right? Right. There's a small graduating class, and we're all pretty much just specifically with sports teams and athletics across the nation. And um, we, just like you said, you did that very well with... Um, with a combination of uh, occupational therapists, but we were also taught a lot from osteopathic doctors. Okay. And so that allowed us to to bring in the more holistic approach of of looking at the body's blood flow with the nerve flow, and then how to nourish them while, while everybody's going through their mechanics of of sport. Right. Cool. And then what is the acronym to follow your athletic therapy background? The next is the Diploma of Acupuncture, which I got from McMaster University. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah we got a couple Mac When were you there? Uh, 2007. 2007. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I finished in 2003, and you were done there? Uh, 2004, I was done there. So. Nice. So acupuncture diploma? Yeah, and I finished that while I was uh, completing the athletic therapy degree as, at the same time. Right. And so then that brought me uh, into professional sports. I, I left the schooling, got right in with the Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment uh, position as an athletic therapist for the Toronto Marlies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Their farm team, and we worked uh, quite closely with the, the main club, the Maple Leafs. Sweet. Um, and then uh, during that process, I was with the Toronto Blue Jays for a year and with the Toronto Argonauts during the 2007 season. Nice. And uh, was doing acupuncture periodically throughout the season with those guys. 
Uh, and then in 2008, 2009, I went up to Ottawa with uh, senators and spent the year with them and just felt that everything was a little bit limited looking at the whole picture with these guys. Um, learning from the doctors, the chiropractors, the orthopedic surgeons, the neurologists, but there was still a gap. And then that's what brought me into the naturopathic medicine world. Cool. Um, so I didn't really want to compete with those uh, those practitioners, and I just wanted to create my own separate entity and found that um, the, the naturopathic world kind of just... Uh, um, it just embraced my knowledge quite well. So I learned to to realign and then nourish and then strengthen the people as a whole. Right. And not only in their athletic career themselves, but then through a disease process, should they encounter that in their young age or in their older age. So right. I can see them through their entire life. Cool. And that's, I mean, that's something that I think is really neat nowadays. You're getting individuals like yourself that are... Um, kind of getting these accreditations in so many various disciplines and and bringing them, you know, formulating them in a unique, a very unique way that's kind of only carved out through the experiences that you've gone through with, obviously yours is heavily sports influenced, but by adding in naturopathy into that mix is, is pretty unique, you know what I mean? Like there's probably not too many that have such a heavy sports background, especially in athletic therapy and stuff but then tying in, you know, a little bit uh, of a, a different approach to health and wellness in general with naturopath, right? So yeah. are there a lot of naturopathic practices uh, and techniques that you can use to apply to like sports injuries and sports medicine? Uh, definitely. Uh, yeah. And that's what I've been trying to gear my practice towards is, is looking through how the body functions, say if uh, with athletes right now during these hot days of summer, they're, they're depleting magnesium, so they're from the heat and from the excessive exercise. You gotta come float more, that's what they need to do. Yeah, yeah. float and, yeah. Uh, and get supplements. magnesium supplements exactly. or, uh, or acupuncture. So with the, with, the, with the lack of magnesium, what are some of the symptoms of that and what would, uh, what would somebody notice if they're de magnesium deficient? The first one would be cramping uh, during the exercise itself. Uh, the next would be cramping uh, during the evenings while they're trying to sleep. You wake up with that Charlie horse. Uh, that's definitely a sign of magnesium deficiencies because what magnesium does is just allows uh, muscles to, to relax. So magnesium flushes into the cell, it calms down, and then as it leaves the cell when it's depleted, there's more calcium, and that's what creates that contracture. Right. So your muscles basically just function better with the proper amounts of magnesium. Uh, yes. And I, I heard through a float tank that you actually can never oversaturate your magnesium for some reason. Is that true? That's true, yes. Yeah. Well, how come, what is, why is that? Just the body's natural mechanisms that it sets up through um, basically electronic current. Right, so, so you like can basically just, float as long as you want, and you can never overdose on magnesium. So it'll get to like a level of like homeostatic balance, and then once it's reached, that's just you know it's just done uploading basically. Yeah, cool. Yeah, because that's something that is like a side spin-off from the different benefits of floating. Obviously, is the fact that you do get to soak in this extremely dense solution of magnesium sulfate and absorb it through your skin, right. you know, and uh, that's why a lot of athletes can use it for recovery purposes and, and just expediting that process too. And since learning about this uh, process and like, the float house here in Vancouver, and my time has been limited in Vancouver, but uh, as soon as I heard about it, I've been referring marathoners. Right. Uh, I was with the running room group, about 40 uh, participants last week, and uh, endorsed you guys and said, because cool. there's about six out of 40 people who are cramping mid-race. We talked about the magnesium, and we talked about another simple solution to calm down from their day and then, uh, and from their run, which is quite stressful. Yeah, and, sure. uh, Come to Float House, right? I think just for the relief on your joints, like the the pounding of running, this is so brutal on your knees and hips and low back and everything else. I think mean, just to go in the tank and kind of just get away from gravity and decompress a little bit, I think would be really beneficial for a lot of runners, actually. Oh, yeah, for sure. Increasing the joint space, which brings in more blood flow, brings in all kinds of nutrients. It's, it's right. Yeah. It's Clear amazing. metabolic byproducts too. Yeah, it's amazing. Cool. Um, what What would you say, like, in terms of 
uh, like Active Solutions Medicine is your company that you started in Vancouver here. Um, you know, in terms of your experience and your expertise, what type of uh, people uh, and clients, you know, should seek you out? Like, what, what type of things that are, are best suited in terms of your kind of uh, realm, would you say? Uh, well, for sure, definitely the active population. Yeah. Uh, Age is, is limitless with, uh, with that population. Sure. Um, and anybody who is really trying to understand their body and understand why they're experiencing symptoms, be willing to open up their perception as to why they, like, where their symptoms are coming from, uh, whether it's lifestyle, whether it, which is diet, sleep, exercise regimes. Um, and anybody who's just looking to increase their performance or increase their lifestyle by even 1% to 10% to 50% better of what they are at currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing I noticed because I was seeing, um, you know, just from my personal health, a chiropractor, I uh, recently started seeing an osteopath and then, um, you know, and I have had some uh, sessions with you and I found that each professional was able to kind of um, identify different things that were all very relevant, you know, and it's, it's important to, you know, if you're getting something treated for some reason, if you can visit another practitioner of sorts because they can either confirm or deny or, or even, you know, just, you just get a greater picture kind of, of, of what's happening, you know, and uh, I feel that's just important to, it's been important that from my personal experience is to go to different people and, and see what they all have to offer. Definitely, we we strongly encourage anybody, whether whether it's a chronic problem or an acute problem, just to go and see as many practitioners as you can. Um, at at Active Solutions Medicine, we have a, another traditional Chinese medicine uh, doctor who's working with us. Uh, we're bringing in a chiropractor, we're bringing in a massage therapist, and we have a yoga instructor as well. Cool. And so we're just kind of building a, a nice team. And we're carefully selecting each member of that team so that everybody's on the same page. But in the meantime, if you know an osteopath or if you know a, another ho holistic practitioner, we strongly encourage another set of eyes, another set of hands to look at your problem because it's very specific towards you and cool. your lifestyle. And just so for yeah, people ahead. people like me who don't know, uh, holistic means looking at the entire system as as a whole and. Not necessarily saying one disease is only caused by one thing, but rather your diet can play a part. And your is that is that correct? Uh, yeah, and and uh, for example, somebody who recently came in was a, a small twelve-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. She broke her arm about mm -hmm. four months ago. Uh, unfortunate accident on a trampoline, and she's a uh, in cheering cheerleading, and so. Uh, she redid it. She was slow to heal. All the images look good. Slow to heal. Right. And then she came in because she broke her arm again a second time, four months later in the exact same location. Mm. And so just how we can look at that holistically is, is then we look at uh, what nutrients is she not getting? Why is that bone still weak? So we look at uh, allergies in through the gut, which is causing inflammation. We're looking at poor sleep because at, at 12 years old, she's coming into uh, an interesting time physically with uh, reproduction, um, like sexual maturity, uh, all, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Right. Yeah, and just okay. lots of growth happening. So like if she's not sleeping well, then it's going to start impacting all these, you know, various developments that she should normally be going through, right? For sure. So, if you're going to tell somebody, like, what are like the big like building blocks? If you want to have like an overall like healthy body, what are the, what are the big components of that, in your opinion? Number one is is probably proper active active rest. Um, let let your body heal itself. Uh, you can do that through the float house. That's where you guys come in big time, yeah. with uh, away from the activity, yeah. uh, which is sleeping hygiene, putting away the electronics about an hour before bed, just treating your room as as sleeping uh, versus eating and TV and all that. Uh, the second building block is definitely nutrition, fueling your pro your body, mm -hmm. um, and then third is a proper 
a periodization program of training. So in that, you have your active rest and then you have your, your training methods um, tailored throughout the entire 12 months mm -hmm. of the year. Yeah, I think that point of peri periodization is, is huge that yeah. a lot of people um, just in a general health and wellness regime probably don't do. They probably get into a good routine, see their initial gains, but then just kind of keep doing the exact same things all the time. And it's so important to, um, it, whether it's to, you know, change up the stimulus by doing completely different exercises or, or modalities of exercise or, you know, just in, increasing the in intensity or the duration or whatever that is, right? And, um, and, and making it cyclical. So you, you're not always just like at one level, like sometimes you need to come down and like reduce the overall volume and then, and then you can maybe grow it back up to a whole new level. So that kind of up and down and that periodization is, is uh, critical, I think. That's a huge point. For sure, just changing the forces so that your body can, can adapt, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, in a planar position or for a few weeks and then rotational forces. And then while your body is, is training for those rotation forces, it's then healing from the, the plane motions. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing about active solutions medicine is that we not only incorporate the periodization of the training programs, but we, we look at doing periodization of the nutrition itself so that you're not eating too much while you're in like a slower phase, which will change body composition or change sleeping patterns. And so we can, we can adapt proteins and carbohydrates and fats. Right. And that's probably, probably, will you give somebody like a, a nutrition program to follow and just say like, this is your program, these are the foods you eat and just, will you take it that in depth or you kind of just give them guidelines? I really like guidelines. I like yeah. freedom of, of living just so that they can enjoy their life better. Mm -hmm. There's not breakfast, these three meal, these three foods you're going to eat all the time. It's just, these are the foods that will cause some inflammation and these are the foods that won't cause some inflammation and we'll give you a few ideas of, of how to bring those foods together. But, uh, it's just kind of open-ended. Now, yeah. when you recommend this prescription of like periodization, um, what about for someone who's just, someone who wants to be fit and healthy and stay in shape? Would you recommend being that periodization even for someone like that? I mean, because I know when you're training for like a, a season or like a, an event or something like that, you definitely want to like gear up your training a certain at a certain time before that event. And gear it down a little bit so you recover a little bit more and then after that maybe have a rest period but if you're let's say you just want to be like fit active healthy would you still want to use periodization techniques to to maximize that the periodization at that point would then um, be a little bit more broad so more upper body versus lower body uh, uh, speed training versus just cardio um, where if you're dealing with a specific athlete who's going through a uh, a, pr a program mm -hmm. you would have it a macro cycle a micro cycle power intensity frequency uh, it gets much more specific but um, just to limit the average person uh, from injury and to make sure that they're still enjoying their exercise and motivation you're you're saying okay well in the summertime you'll do a little bit more outdoor biking you'll do about uh, outdoor activities like canoeing or paddleboarding. Uh, that's why Vancouver is great for these outdoor activities. Where then in the winter you'll get into more of a relaxation of doing a little bit more yoga. You'll get to uh, get into the pool or just something a little bit different. Um, I think that kind of happens naturally for a lot of people too. Like for myself, it just changes the season. We'll just you know instead of uh, instead of. You know, doing so much weights and yoga and stuff. I'll get outside and I'll do more hiking, do the gross grind. You know, just things like that. So I think so. You kind of cycle it. I mean, at least I do um, because of the weather. You know. Oh, for sure. And that's yeah. where there's usually a range between six and eight weeks where people will fall off a regimented program, whether it's nutrition or exercise. Mm. And I find just by keeping it broad and, and keeping it open ended, they're enjoying it and they they understand that at that six week range they'll probably want to change. Yeah. Like, what would you say for me? Like, for like, I have a pretty set gym routine. Like, I've I don't have like the degrees that you guys have, but I've been training since I was like sixteen, and I you know went through university, and I've been, done all sorts of different things, and been coached by some pretty decent level coaches and things like that. But I have like a routine that I use, and it's just basically full body, 
and I have my, you know, I have my, my set exercises that I do pretty much every time I'm at the gym. And um, I, I like that it gives me a pretty good base level of fitness. But I'm wondering how much I'm limiting myself by just kind of going in there and doing that. It's like an hour. It's like fairly intense. And uh, I just, I kind of do the same thing every time, you know. I guess what would be some of the, the downfalls of doing it like that? That's where you would lead into uh, kind of overuse uh, injuries, like a tendonitis or a tendinopathy in mm-hmm. through your shoulders or your ankles. Yeah. Um, like a, a lack of motivation where you, you might not even notice that you've been into, you haven't been into the gym for two or three weeks uh, until, until you start like getting tighter in the, in the belt or tighter yeah. in the, in the shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you're just saying that basically, I mean, I guess the biggest risk for me would be like, I'm doing the same exercise every single time. I'm well, just, then I'm also you're like, not really progressing neurologically too. That's true too. You know, like yeah. that whole element of, of training, um, you know, just giving your body and your brain a different movement pattern to do um, is important to just to, to maintain really healthy neurological function, right? Like in different patterns of movement and things like that, because it's really easy to get really proficient in one way of doing something, but then when you try to do something like the opposite or the reverse, it can feel very awkward and like uncoordinated. Sure. Yeah. Well, for me, it's more like the, that hour at the gym is more about efficiency and like sure. getting like an overall good workout that's going to get me some decent results. And then I, I find when I do just what's up my other activities, like if I do yoga, the yoga is nice because you're always the classes are always different, so you're doing different mo- movements and uh, or when I'm hiking or something like that. Um, I, I feel like that's my the way of diversifying Diversity. my training and yeah. like the gym routine is just like this something I do just to get a little bit of more muscle mass built a little bit of strength but maintain a decent level of fitness as well yeah and it's so. good for preventing injuries and things like that too yeah. general tendon strength yeah, that's what I was going to go with yeah just injuries so a lot of times people won't do that extra bit of yoga or they won't do the grouse grind or, or some other trail and then they go to walk off a sidewalk when it's a little slippery and they roll their ankle. Yeah. So like it's pull their groin or something. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. But for us, like in our family, actually, we have like um, all of us, like our, our dad uh, and all three of us, all three brothers actually all have like low back stuff. All of us, you know. I don't know why we all have that exactly. And we've debated about this oh, for a had, long we've had time. We've lengthy philosophical discussions about why we have lower back problems yeah. and you know going treating it from like a holistic perspective you know there's lots that tie into it there could be congenital things there could be uh, movement behaviors and movement patterns uh, psychological patterns um, st- various levels of stress you know what i mean all those things will play into it right yeah for me that's where it gets fun just trying to find all the pieces to the puzzle and and tie all, all yeah. those things together where like you said, it's psychological. And then like, or said, like maybe there's one that's been missing. Like if you keep focusing on the physical, the physical, the physical, then one small tweak in like the nutrition or one small t- tweak in like the psychological has like the greatest impact potentially, right? So that's why having like that holistic approach to I think in you know everything is is important. You're not gonna just you know branch off and get too focused on something that maybe isn't the big thing you know the big problem i don't know about you but i noticed that like my lower back i I feel like it gets worse in periods of stress i I feel like it's there's a correlation there you know when things get kind of stressful in my life is there any research supporting that do you know Uh, all kinds of research are you are you familiar with dr gabor mate yeah 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 he he talks about that how how much how much going through stress or different stages of 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 life can Affect your health and yeah. even cause diseases. Like I know stress will definitely like it'll hurt your immune system. It's going to raise your blood pressure. It's going yeah. to increase your heart rate. All those different things. But I didn't realize it could go as far as like actually making your joints worse or damaging your joints in some way. But that's possible too. Definitely, and that's that's a lot of that physiologically is caused by neurotransmitters, and so neurotransmitters are basically hormones released out of the nerves. Uh, one, say for your low back, would be a possible depletion of serotonin. Serotonin, 80% of it is, is produced in the intestines. So that stuff can't go to the brain, so it just keeps circulating in the body. And uh, there's another one that is just specifically in the brain. 
But if you're if you're stressed, you're probably changing the diet a little bit just because of uh, uh, different cravings of carbs or fats. Um, because when you're stressed, you want to become a little bit happier. You try mm -hmm. to reward yourself a little bit more, mm -hmm. and people will grab the fattier foods. And there are studies that show that a fattier meal actually helps increase uh, serotonin levels and increase production. Mm -hmm. So increasing serotonin is bad for your joints. No, it, it, or, when, you're, when you're stressed, it starts to deplete it. Oh, so you're saying when you're stressed, it might be better to add more fats to your diet then? A little uh, bit, yeah. Okay. Within reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel, this is kind of on a different road as well, but um, there's a lot of different like schools of thought as to uh, saturated fats and fats in general and how much of a role it actually plays in like heart disease and cholesterol and all, and all of that the whole thing um, whereas some people are saying now it's not the fats it's not the fats that are causing people to have heart attacks or you have clogged arteries or whatever it is and they say it's actually more sugar or st like sugar and actually stress as well hypertension that, or hypertension yeah, inflammation it's, inflammation it's, so, it's more the root cause of that stuff as opposed to necessarily the fats that you're eating would you agree with that uh, um, at this stage of my career, in my experience over seven or eight years, yeah, I would almost 100% agree with that. What right. if you're eating a, a diet that's like heavy in like animal animal fats? If you're eating like chicken or beef, you know, and things like that, do you think that plays a role in like arterial cardiovascular health? Anything to an extreme like that does put yourself at at a susceptible level of a problem, whether it's degeneration of muscles or joints or intestinal issues or, or brain health. Mm. Uh, it's everything in moderation, even moderation. Um, I like that. <laughs> I like that line a lot, actually. I used that for a while. I did use that for a while. I did. <laughs> everything in moderation, including moderation. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you just need to... Go, go crazy. Go to like Look Mandarin. Splurge. For people in BC, you guys don't know what Mandarin is. I know. They you know what Mandarin is. Oh, yeah, I know what Oh, Mandarin. my God. It's, it's, the, it's like the, the mecca of all you can eat Chinese food buffets. Yeah, there's like four aisles of it's like, yeah, <laughs> double it's like, layers. It's huge. It's, they're just enormous, yeah. like food factories. And, yeah. But it's, man, it's once in a while, <laughs> it's, it's good. Yeah. 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 Um, let's go into inflammation because that's a really, it's been a pretty hot topic the last like five years, I'd say. And like, you know, some, and there's kind of two sides of that coin too. Some people say like, let the inflammation response happen because it's the body's natural way of healing something. But then others is like, well, inflammation is, chronic inflammation is, you know, really debilitating in different ways. Can you kind of take us through the inflammation response and like good, bad, how to work with it, manage it? Like, what do you, what do you kind of look at that as a whole? Um, so let's just start with acute inflammation. Acute, acute inflammation, inflammation from, say, an injury. Uh, that response is, is what you need to heal. It brings up uh, macrophages, so the body's natural uh, bodies that will help to, to increase blood flow. They help to take away all the, the damaged tissue. Um, and so you need that to heal. Uh, they also bring up other nutrients, so that initial influx of inf of inflammation, which is increased blood flow, increased uh, profusion, is necessary. Um, the next stage is the is the chronic inflammation. Okay, before we go there, I want to yeah. go back to that one. Now, being an athletic therapist, you experience like say a football guy rolls his ankle, has a sprained ankle, and you need to return him back to uh, playing as quickly as possible. And one of the you know modalities is you know icing, right? Yeah, we were just uh, talking about that a while ago. So on this podcast? No, no, not on this podcast. Oh, no, no. Okay, in general. So I was in like, life. what did I did blank out for thirty minutes? There? <laughs> it's possible. Um, <laughs> and so, like, because they'll, they'll use ice, which in my mind, you know, suppresses the inflammation response. But is it more of like ice it down to? to constrict it and then let it come back to further expand it to like and just expedite that whole process like what's the thinking behind that side of it then like why are they restricting the inflammation at that time if it's going to help potentially heal that's where it gets uh interesting debate because yeah um yeah that's what we're all about we want to yeah, get to the, the root we want to get to the, the oh it's great so that's the that's the, the rice technique 
Yeah, yes. different race for a yeah, while, rest, for decades, ice, ice compression, compression. Yeah. elevation, right? So uh, the way that we usually like to do it nowadays in in medicine, at least from s- some of the brilliant physicians that I've met over the years, uh, particularly one in Chicago, Doctor Ross Hauser, is uh, is actually meat. So rice versus meat for what athletes need. Okay. Um, meat is movement. Uh, exercise, uh, analgesics, and treatments. And analgesics are um, it just basically it could be a t- so pain they're basically yeah, painkillers, okay. pain relievers. Uh, so the pain relievers is basically what causes people to stop moving, causes people to grab extra uh, anti-inflammatories or any kind of pharmaceutical intervention. Right. Um, you could do it topically. Uh, through like menthol, you can do it topically through electric currents like tens, or the electric acupuncture. And short term, it's uh, beneficial to do it through a pharmaceutical intervention, such as uh, the NSAIDs for a few days, just to to mo- just to basically modulate that pain response. Okay. Um, the the. The the ice initially isn't overly great. It it does control the inflammation, which limits secondary problems because your tissue allows a certain level of expansion between cells and between blood vessels and ligaments. Uh, if that gets too large, then that's when excessive bleeding occurs. Immobility. Yeah, immobility, um, further damage. And so that lengthens the rehab. And so you'll, that's why you're only doing it for about 15 minutes a few times a day. Right. I've heard that if you do it longer, it actually it's, uh, it, it can be damaging as opposed to for sure. For you. So it's 15 minutes. And the old prescription they used to give you was 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off. And you, yeah, once an hour. Yeah. 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 Um, but now after that first uh, 36 to 48 hours, uh, I like to do contrast. Mm. So um, <clears throat> five minutes of cold. And then 15 minutes of, of heat. Mm. And that allows you to control that inflammation with that initial bit of ice. And then bring in all the, the, new, the new blood, the new minerals, the new vitamins, all the new tissue, uh, everything to help feed new tissue. Uh, and then we get them moving, whether it's uh, joints above or below, low impact exercises, so that you're still maintaining a uh, the strength of the tissue itself that's surrounding right. that so injured. Right, so the muscles aren't atrophying, the tendons aren't getting weakening, weakened or shortened even, yeah. right? Yeah, and you're keeping that neurological uh, processing happen through that through that injured ankle or through the injured arm. So by that you mean like the neurological, like the motor neurons are firing, that pathway is still being used and active and not like being depleted in terms of its transmitters and stuff like that? Right, the, the brain is just keeping that memory going. Cool. All right, well, that's good. Well, isn't that, you were telling us a little bit, you were telling me a little bit about how uh, your your muscles weren't actually firing correctly because of potentially an right. injury. So, and does that happen with another question too? Is when I actually, I had my knee reconstructed and uh, I had a lot of atrophy on my, in my right leg. And... Um, do you actually lose like some of that 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 muscular pathway, the neuromuscular pathway that's developed as well? If you're not using that that joint or that or that or that body part, you can uh, for a short period of time. Yeah. And uh, at your at your treatment, we discussed the body's and the brain's ability to communicate in three different levels. The first level, the basic level, is locally. So where the nerves are telling that muscle to contract, that's the first stage. Mm-hmm. The second stage is where it's where those nerves are leaving the spine. Um, and so that transmission is going to the muscles. The third level, up a little bit higher, is is in this little nerve bundle called a ganglion. Basically that's the where the brain's signal goes to this little ganglion. It processes that information and then shoots it down the nerves and then into the muscle. And so through electric acupuncture, through uh, physical stimulation, you can stimulate all three levels. And then that's what limits the atrophy. It, it maintains that muscle memory and brain memory of what that person can do and what that limb can do. Right, because when you worked with me, you highlighted how like, oh, your, your glute's not firing 
when it should when it's lifting your leg, right? right. And that could be um, you know creating some of the overexertion of some of my spinal muscles, like my QL, which I was yeah. having issues with, right? The, the torsion in through the sacrum and through the L5, which is, there's a little bit of micro-inflammation in through there, and that causes the pain when you're yeah. stressed. Or when so you're basically what you weak. did was you put in uh, acupuncture needles and then actually attached an electric current to those to get them to fire. And at first they were like firing out of sequence, like they were asynchronized, right. and then... Um, over the course of like 15 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes, they, the, the, the contractions started firing together. And, and what was that attributed to that you were saying? I don't remember. Just the miscommunication between those three levels. The, right. the brain kind of forgot how to, how to do that pattern. And then with the electricity at a fr certain frequency, it, uh, it relearns that pattern. And then that glute engages, starts to extend the hip, and then your hamstrings and the body can move uh, properly yeah. properly yeah and, and that's something like power. i think i want to kind of just get out of my soapbox about for athletic therapists and because i've worked with athletic therapists um when i was working with the hamilton tiger cats as their strength coach and you know contemporary ats are not recognized by insurance plans and stuff like that where physiotherapists are chiropractors are but like the at in my experience, has especially coming from a very active lifestyle, an athletic background, trying to continue athletics as, as I get older and stuff like that, um, the eighth, the athletic therapists, they just they, that's what that's their realm. That's what they're doing. That's mm -hmm. what they're. So even if you are just like a recreational athlete or a, someone that has an active lifestyle. Like seeing an athletic therapist is extremely different, in my opinion, from seeing a physiotherapist because they're so much more well versed in the athletic movements involved and those pressures. And like, it's very different from just like basic life movements. You know what I mean? Because you're you're asking more of your body, and um, you know. So if you haven't had an experience with an AT, I highly suggest you seek one out because. Um, especially if you have an active lifestyle, because they're they're going to be able to address it more specifically to what you're trying to get back to, you know. For sure, and and in that active population, it's not a knock against physiotherapists. No, uh, they're better trained for people rehabbing from a heart attack or from a from a stroke than we are. Totally. Um, but our lack of coverage in a in a larger uh, insurance company is just. Because it's a smaller population, we lack political power, we lack uh, f financial support, mm -hmm. just because it's a small population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where it is a little bit unfortunate from a... Well, our goal is to get flotation therapy on there one day too, so I hope ATs are on there well before flotation therapy. I would well, it's recognized but, uh, uh, in where? Sweden? Sweden recognizes yeah. flotation therapy on insurable yeah. benefits, so if there's anyone out there that's involved with getting benefits in your insurance company... Uh, let's let's hear from you because it'd be awesome to get both of those on, you know, in, in right. the future. So back to the inflammation. So you're yes. saying inflammation <laughs> is back to inflammation. Back to inflammation. But you're saying that inflammation is actually is important for healing. But then everyone talks about how bad inflammation is, and it causes all these problems. So how much inflammation is good inflam inflammation, and what's bad inflammation? It's. The, the, you're like that's so, such a generic way. It's of totally very specific yeah. to the scenario. Yeah, that's yeah. where you look at the actual, um, the whole biochemistry of it. Uh, basically, the little bit of inflammation is good just to bring more blood flow. Mm -hmm. um, chronic inflammation, wh which is uh, aggravating to joints, because it, with that inflammation, it it doesn't. Uh, it's aggravated from different proteins, basically. There's different proteins that will cause degeneration of tissue, will, will uh, weaken the tissue, weaken the, the strength of the tissue. And when you move from the chronic inflammation, um, or into the chronic inflammation, sorry, you really need to, to look at what's causing it. Is it caused from uh, nutritionally? Is it caused from from the mechanics being off? So, say if you're constantly doing the same movement patterns, and you're you're just con you're rolled in, uh, and you're just aggravating that tendon, you're just going to keep causing that 
chronic inflammation, which isn't going to... It won't heal it at all. Yeah, it won't yeah. heal it. It yeah. causes a fraying. It causes weakness. Yeah. Uh, not only to that single tendon, but then to the rest of the rotator cuff, to the rest of the joint. Okay. And I guess we kind of talked a little bit earlier about the contrasting, the heat and cold. Do you Is that like a repeated cycle? So you go uh, cold, hot, cold, hot. And how many times would you repeat something like that? I recommend just about two to three times a day initially. Um, but sorry, would you go? I mean, would you go from cold to hot, and then go back into cold, and then go back into hot, or would you just go cold and then hot and then leave it? Like just like one cycle of it, or do you continue it? In an ideal uh, environment, you would repeat it. You would do actually one minute of cold and three minutes of hot, just a one to three ratio. However, in uh, people's busy lives these days, they can usually only fit in one cycle because uh, they have kids right. or they have work. So you said one to three ratio, you mean one a cycle of cold and one three of hot? Right. You guys keep it down. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we got a little uh, interrupt in there. But um, yeah, and then in terms of the cycles, it's hot, cold, hot, cold. And then I was told, do you always want to end on cold? Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Did we already cover that? Sorry. No, we didn't get no, there. We didn't I was, I was going to that though. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And why is that, why is it best to end on cold? It just keeps the it just brings the tissue back down, and so that as a a reflex effect, you're still like you'll finish on cold, but the reflex after the cold expands the tissue and brings in new blood again. Okay. Okay, so it's kind of like finishing off without like the extreme heat, but it kind of it'll kind of naturally level out to where it should be almost right. if yeah. you finish with cold. Right. Cool. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. And then um, you know, you said diet has a big part of your inflammation response. What foods in general cause are inflammatory and which ones are anti inflammatory? Don't say coffee. Don't say coffee. What is coffee? <laughs> It's, it's all in, most of it's individual based. Oh, yeah. oh uh, okay. it comes from probably uh, not good for me. It really, do. sometimes people respond great with coffee. People don't respond too well with coffee. It depends on um, DNA. It depends mm. on where your background is. Um, basically, uh, some of the foods like the easiest one would, would be to say is dairy or sugars. That's yeah. the easiest, but I've met guys uh, in athletes in my life where they're not affected by dairy at all. Mm -hmm. They come from a background, mostly Scandinavian or German, and, Interesting. and they, they can process milks and dairies quite well huh. versus somebody from uh, so the, the Central America or South America or, uh, or a warmer climate, they, they don't, don't do so well. How can you test things like that? Yeah. Like if I want to go and say, okay, what are things I'm responding well to versus not? Um, is there things you can do for that? Yeah, you, we actually just take a sample of the blood and we send it to a, a certain lab and that lab takes the proteins uh, and see and looks at how the, the DNA and, and how the proteins in the body react to that food you can do this at active solutions uh we can yes Sweet. i'm going to be doing that yes, for sure me too that's yeah. awesome yeah i well, wanted i want to do that for years and then yeah. you're able to break down that report and be like okay this is what it's telling us and go yeah, from there I've, I've actually had almost every one of my family members do it so far and uh for example for my mother she just arrived today she was explaining that uh the only food that she can't really eat right now is egg whites and uh, the best grain for her is rye, and rye has gluten in it. However, we generally say gluten is bad, but that's just a kind of a broad statement. But sure. we get into the specifics of each grain and each protein and each each food. I, I heard gluten's only bad if you actually have a gluten allergy, and if you don't have a gluten allergy, it's not bad at all, really. Yeah, and it's yeah. just the protein. It's Everything's back to the proteins. The protein in gluten is, is the technical name is gliadin. Uh, just like in, in milk, it's uh, casein. Or, and so it's just how the body reacts to those proteins. So do you think that like different regions of the world, say like Eastern European versus, I guess this is what you're kind of getting, but Eastern European people, maybe Southeast Asian or South American people, um, would all, should have certain different diet types. 
and should have different diets. Well, they're probably their biology, physiology evolved based off the diets they were mm -hmm. uh, getting within those localizations of the world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. So, that's and what if, was built if that's what your DNA. ethnicity was built on, it probably adapt to those types of foods, right? For so sure. it's true. Like we get really honed in on dairy free or gluten free and or low fat, whereas you know if you know if you come from uh, an ethnicity of, of uh, Native Americans that lived in the far north, then they had probably really conducive diets for like there's almost like, like the an Inuit, all fat, they were all like they eat whale blubber and fish and that's like it exactly yeah, yeah. You know? they did really well with fats yeah yeah so and those rules probably still apply today because obviously our ethnicities still all evolved from wherever we came from and so it's kind of unique to find out okay where where does my family come from get my blood test. And also maybe research the diets they ate there and kind of incorporate. Is that maybe a rule of thumb that you could uh, encourage, you think? Oh, well, for sure. That, that's what cool. we look at. Never really thought about that. Before. Now, what if, like, for example, um, my girlfriend's Southeast Asian, and if we had children, now, if we tested that kid's blood type, would he be like, could he have a mix of all different types and you're just like, or he or she, and you could say, like, well, you know, you got some Eastern European in there, so you're good with the dairy, but... Uh, you know, the Southeast Asian, you're going to get the rice, but you don't want to eat too much. Like mangoes. or Yeah, you stay away from the mangoes, you know. Yeah. But could but could it be like that specific where you can like look at an individual, even if they were like, um, what's a good word? But the blood can probably tell you everything. Like a mix? Yeah, it's, like a it's, genetic it's, mix? Like it can tell you exactly what that individual should be eating based on their genetics? Yeah, with the testing, we can look at a, a baseline of 40 foods and we can go up to 400, 500 foods that we would look at and examine. And you're given a graph and it's numbered, um, and it's easy to read, you're, you're, you're given, okay, well, the, say, mangoes or kiwi are not good for you. They will cause a lot of inflammation, which causes irritability, issues with uh, the nervous system. Uh, so how do they figure that out, though? How do they know? Like a man like, I know mango is just an example, but I mean, how would they know that that specific food is not good for you based on... What's in your blood? Uh, t just seeing how the body reacts to that blood. So you're taking that blood. You basically you're you're taking a sample of it. You're introducing that food to the blood sample, and if that blood sample coagulates, which is uh, just creates a, a clot. Mm -hmm. um, just speaking very generally, that's not good for you. Right. But if it forms uh, a little bit more. Like viscous, if it's a little bit more blood-like, obviously. Yeah, like, yeah. Just so it's essentially, healthy. it's not becoming inflammatory at that point. Right. Ah, okay. So it's okay. just that simple. So they'll just go and they'll test certain foods. With, mm. Now, when you do that test for myself, would they? Would I just tell you what my my diet is like and the test of certain foods that I normally eat, or would they just test like a spectrum of foods and say they recommend you stay stay away from certain things during the intake? That's what we can we can find out. We can find out which test would be best, and we can recommend certain foods. We can rend, uh, increase certain foods because we sometimes we need to expand your diet. Yeah. If you're finding, say, low libido or low recovery, we would look for foods that uh, have different levels of zinc uh, or selenium, just some of the micronutrients. Yeah. Because uh, those are help with uh, testosterone. Testosterone, everything. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Um, now, what's that type of test called if, if someone wanted to go and ask their naturopath or, or practitioner for this type of test? Does it have a name? I would just call it the easiest way is just the food allergy test. Okay, food allergy test. Okay, sweet. Hmm. All right. Now, I want to kind of get into a bit with you because uh, I've had brief discussions with you about this. Um, some of the, the, the latest and, uh, you know, potentially greatest uh, healing recovery modalities. Like, so, for example, a lot of athletes, ex-athletes like myself and yourself, you get, you know, knee joint issues or back issues. And, you know, and then we're hearing of these athletes now, like, for example, Peyton Manning. He had, like, mm. nearly a career-ending um, neck injury, neck injury yeah. and surgery and just really rough rehab. And, like, it was just a mess, right? Yeah. And then he went to Germany and had something done where they extract something. And, like, what I think it was, like, the red blood cells... And I don't know what it's called exactly, but they put it in like a centrifuge and they like inject it with growth therapy. hormones or something and okay. they just inject it back in. What is that? That's prolotherapy. That's prolotherapy? Pro therapy? Okay. Yeah. And what is that exactly? Uh, basically, you, same, you extract some blood, put it in the centrifuge, and 
whatever level of degeneration that person is at for that joint, uh, you could take just the red blood cells and you could re-inject that to help promote healing. And it promotes healing because it's increasing blood right to that tissue. Say it's meniscus or it's the ligaments, which don't really have a lot of blood flow. Right. It increases the blood flow to that. If it's something more degenerative, like an arthritis, like an osteoarthritis in the knees or the hips, you would take the stem cells, uh, which is more located in the fat. Um, so you could take it from the tibia or you could take it from the, the shin bone or from the iliac crest, which is the hip. And you just take those stem cells and you combine that with a few nutrients, which help to proliferate stem cells. And then that the stem cells will basically become whatever they touch. So it actually starts to regenerate uh, cartilage and wow. and reduce and reverse I arthritis. Have, I have so to that, try that. So out. that's been like you could apply that. For example, if you had like um, deteriorating cartilage of your knee, just overuse for the years, pounding impacts on pavement or running in general. Yeah. Well, so they're example, seeing like they can increase cartilage growth on a knee. Yeah, and this isn't this isn't actually a new therapy in in North America. It's relatively new and just coming into the media now. Uh, I was learning from Dr. Ross Hauser over in Chicago. I've been going there for the last two years, right. basically on a somewhere between a six and eight week cycle, uh, and just watching this guy do it. He he treats twenty five to thirty people a day, and uh, they came from all over for the world. Ther- Prolo. For- Therapy? Prolo therapy, yeah. He did uh, one of three different types, which is the regular prolo, or the blood, or the stem cells. And uh, you just kind of monitored with uh, actual images of ultrasounds, or MRIs, or CT scans. And uh, he did whatever he thought was necessary and, and consulted with the patient. They do it over in Germany. Germany is huge because they're not really influenced by the governments. Uh, they don't have like a... Yeah, because it's like, there's a lot of, like people are scared about stem cells for whatever reason. What's well, like, the controversy around stem cell, cells, right? But it was banned saying, for a long time in right. the yeah. US. What's, why are they banned? I don't understand why, what's the argument behind that? Killing children. I think it, just, it was just a lack of, uh, lack of knowledge, lack of long-term studies, so they didn't know how it was going to, to react. Yeah, but they, but it's, they think, I think they like prevented a lot of research from happening because of these really old and outdated legis- legislation. And I thought it was more of a, a religious thing, actually. Well, I think it was how they were getting it was how they were getting the stem cells. So fetus, initially, uh, yeah, yeah, they were getting it from fetuses and from the umbilical cord. That's what they initially knew. Yeah, but they're finding that they can just easily extract it from your shin or from your hip, and getting a, a decent amount. What kind of, what, now, what if a therapy like that, how much does that go for like, if you're going to get that done? Uh, what I've seen is break it down by joint. So starting cost is usually around $300 uh, per oh, wow. injection. That's it? Yeah. And how many injections get, do you need? Uh, if it's a, an acute injury, uh, you're only going three to four times over a six-month to eight-month period. And a chronic like injury? And a chronic injury... Uh, Usually, ten to twelve times, and they over, reevaluate. Yeah, There's but over like a two or three year period, um, and it might sound like a lot initially. However, if you look at your chiropractic treatments, your physio treatments, your massages that you need, you're spending about a hundred and twenty dollars. Sure. And this is healing. And, and this yeah. is the, the thing about that too is it's just you know it's your body. It's your body. It's the most important thing that you have. You know, right. and like if you recycling. can prolong a joint and not get a knee replacement when you're 45 or 50, like that's a pretty good thing to invest in. For sure. Yeah. I, I mean, that's that's why I'm I'm kind of excited about this because my knee, like I injured it when I was 16 playing football. And my ACL reconstructed. They did like the IT band one where they wrap the IT band around and go up through the tibia, tibia into the fibula. No, no, into femur. the uh, femur, sorry. And, um, and like it's, it was pretty good. Like I played on it for an additional seven years after that. That's and crazy. so I got a lot of good use. But now it's just like, it, it just swells up a lot. It's, it's sore. It just it clicks and grinds a lot. And, you know, just not functioning amazingly. 
and uh, and I, I probably have some like cartilage deterioration. Who knows what I have going on there? But if you injected it with stem cells, it would it would definitely like improve it. For sure, yeah. It, wow. We would. You can would you target. Can your, can your clinic do it? Into the next few months, over over into the fall and into the winter, we're going to be doing that. Yes. Really? Do you have to have any sort of like um, accreditation or license to do this kind of stuff? Yeah, you're getting. You're getting different licensing from the orthopedic groups. Uh, so basically what I'll have to do is go down into a South American country just to, for the extra training. Okay. Um, it's through the uh, American Association of Orthopedic Medicine. Um, and then come back here. And then basically at that point, it's just buying the centrifuge and just buying the material to... How much is a centrifuge? Uh, really not that much. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Good. And and how do you get the stem cells out of your your hip or femur? How does that work? Uh, you actually like, drill into the bone. Oh god. Whoa. Do you okay. have to be? It's do intense. you have like a local anesthetic at least? Yeah, usually at the point of where the drill bit is going. I really uh, hope so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I really want to get this done actually, but it's, it's usually just a Q pain. Yeah. Um, but everybody, like at Dr. Ross Hauser's the clinic, everybody walks out. Uh, within an hour, they 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 would drill in, they extract the the stem cells, they reinject it pretty much immediately, uh, within ten minutes or so, and then uh, reinject it into you, into yeah. your knee or whatever. Yeah, all you're doing is is extracting it from the shin, mm-hmm. and taking that with the the dextrose, which is the uh, sugar. Yeah, uh, which helps proliferate and and uh, bring blood to the oh, area. Oh, so there's no like external incubation period that has to happen or anything like that? No. Like, they do it all on site, like you go in, extract, mix, and apply. Total treatment time, uh, start to finish, is maximum around two hours. Wow. Depending on how much you're doing. It is about 300 bucks per injection? So between 300 and about 1,000, yeah. Depending on the 300 joint. 300 and 1,000. Yeah. So for a knee joint, what would you look, be looking at for something like uh, that? 300. Is that the the $1,000 is where you're doing like a whole spinal segment, like your entire neck, both sides. So you're getting into the facets. and But that, that target is more into the ligament laxity from a forward head posture. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I, like I'm, I'm definitely going to try that. If you, when you get that at that clinic, I will, I will do that because like I've been looking for a solution for my knee for a long time, and if I can get like if I can improve it even, you know, by fifty percent, that would be amazing. Oh, Sweet. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So prolotherapy coming soon to active solutions medicine. That's exciting. Yeah, and that's why I moved out to BC because uh, there's too many regulations in Ontario. We can't do it at this moment as a naturopath in Ontario. Oh, okay. well, they're regulated to death out there. They're regulated to death. They like well, the liberal so BC, yeah. you know, the liberal so West Coast. That's yeah. cool. All right. Do you, is there is that on the bubble at all? Like, do you see uh, anything being threatened here, or do they? Do, or do you think it's pretty? It's yeah. open. Yeah, it, they're just embracing it and this cool. medicine really nicely. Well, I just I mean. Why not? Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's the question. Why not? Is there any side that we're overlooking? Is there a side that, uh, you know, like what, why would they restrict something that seems to be really beneficial? Man, and, that's, uh, that's out of my realm. <laughs> out of your realm? Or is it just, yeah, you don't want to put anyone under no the comment. bus? Yeah. Yeah. You know, no. And because that's the thing too, like as, I age as well. Like I wonder, yeah, what other therapies are, are on their way? Like it's exciting in like the whole biotechnology realm of um, you, you know this this day and age to see like, like yeah, what are we going to be able to treat much more effectively now and and keep our bodies moving and and at the activity levels that we want to uh, adhere to. Uh, as we age, you know, so things like this are super promising and yeah, super exciting. It's incredible. It's such an exciting time to be part of medicine. Um, some of the conferences I've been to over the last year and a half are based out of Germany and Israel, and they're kind of the leaders right now with stem cell therapy. Interesting. And they're treating, they're combining stem cells with uh, lasers with uh, nutrition and helping to fight cancers, helping to fight degeneration diseases like like ms like 
like the big thing right now is ALS with yeah. the whole ice bucket challenge. Right. Oh, yeah. I did yeah. the ice bucket challenge. I got to do that today. Actually. Did you oh, get yeah. called out by somebody? And my sister, yeah. So I have to go home and get doused. Get in the tub, yeah. get, in the, yeah. get in the shower and get the ice bucket going. Yeah. The funny thing is when I did it, I didn't realize it was this big thing. I actually have an old teammate from the States who has ALS. And I saw all my own teammates doing it on Facebook. And then one of them mentioned me. So, of course, I did it. But I didn't realize it was like this whole big, long campaign. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how the whole thing and how they, viral it's, it's gone really it's like yeah. if you if you haven't done it then you're not cool it's almost coming to something like that you know it's, it's been very uh, it's been it's amazingly huge. successful yeah. how, how viral that thing went yeah yeah it's, yeah everyone and they've last I, stat I read was they've raised 27 million dollars from that wow amazing that alone over what a month or so well spectacular my, my old teammate he actually had like a fund going for him specifically and their goal was ten thousand. The last I checked, he was at twenty-seven thousand. Actually, oh, wow. So it's wow, pretty pretty impressive. Actually, that's it's huge. Amazing. I donated like a hundred bucks myself. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing I came that I came across was kind of interesting. They said oh, like ninety percent of the people who actually participate in the ice bucket challenge don't donate anything. That's right. What they're finding out. Oh really? Uh, and they're just, well, they're just like they're like yeah, they'll do the ice bucket challenge, but they won't actually donate. Right well, and uh, from what I've gathered, that part of it is because. It's either you do the dump a bucket of ice on your head or donate a hundred dollars to ALS. So I've done know, both. Yeah, well, I don't know, but then yeah, I see most people. Well, I see people are doing both, and I think mm. that's kind of what the spirit should be behind of is do both. But it's or actually, just um, donate. But there's a Seth Godin. I got his. I subscribed to his email list. You know Seth Godin. He's like a marketing kind of guy, yeah. and he he had a cool term that I actually like. We'll start using, and he called it. Um, Oh shoot! What's it called? None. It's ap- opposite of an activist. He called activist. No, 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 no. He had a, a good word for it though. It'll come back to me in a second. Um, oh, fuck! It was so good. Well, it'll it'll come. It'll back. come back. But it, remember, it's been a, jump in. Yeah, an extremely successful uh, campaign. You know, and it just shows you the power of virality and social media and all that kind of stuff. And I think you're going to see a lot of spin-off attempts from this, but then we'll have the same kind of uh, uh, long reign that this is. I was has wondering been. what would be next off of this. Oh, I'm sure everyone's going to be jumping into this for sure. I haven't been called out yet, so we'll I see. should have called you out. I should. I didn't I'll realize this. Is, I go. In, I go into <laughs> the it. cold water out of pleasure. We go oftentimes yeah. to whether it's Seymour River or to Lynn Canyon Park and go on the mountain runoff yeah. and just ice down and it's it feels amazing you like i don't know it just takes away all the inflammation it kind of just sucks all the blood to your core to keep those vital organs sustained and then and then when you come out it just all just you know goes back into the tissues and just it's like a massive body flush you know which is kind of like cryotherapy have you tried that ever the cryotherapy uh, chambers and the chambers? No, I haven't tried the chambers. It's like the ones where they, um, they, you stand in them, I think, and they, they put like, I think it's like liquid nitrogen, they blow on you or something like that for like three minutes. It's like really, really quick. And it goes down to like on negative 100 degrees. And you go in just for uh, a couple of I think it's like minutes. negative 300 or something ridiculous. Yeah, something ridiculous. Yeah. They blast you and then you come out. And apparently, if, apparently it's really, really good. It's getting some pretty strong reviews. But so. I, I think to me that's just like... Um, Almost like a fast way of just going into a cold water bath. Sure, it does the same thing. Yeah, but just for a lot of money. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But um, sorry, crowd therapy people. Have you thought of your term yet? No, I really want to think of the term. That's it's right. so good because I, I want to post on my Facebook. It's about somebody who like, um, who will talk about a cause and be all vocal about it, but they won't actually oh. do anything about it. So like a fake activist. Yeah, but he had a great term for it. Okay. Oh, God, what the hell is it called? Yeah. No, and that's that's something that's that's super prevalent in yeah, today's I've met a lot age. of people like that. Yeah, yeah. especially on social media. Well, it's kind of like the whole uh, Movember thing a little bit. You know, people kind of do it more so because it's like something to do versus you know what it's trying to actually do and raise awareness for prostate cancer or whatever, right? But I don't know. I'm gonna look. We're, it up. we're this weird. Is Humans so much are weird. Right I'm gonna. Bug, I'm gonna look it up. But um, cool. So. How long has Active Solutions been uh, been in Vancouver for? It's pretty new, right? Yeah, very new. I finished the Naturopathic College May the 3rd. It was a Saturday. Okay. And it, t- it took me five years to finish, and I was just needed to get out. Yeah. And I left May 5th. Oh, and wow. I, so I threw the dog, and I met a dog and two cats. Yeah. And I threw them in the truck, 
and I drove across the country. Nice. And I made it by the Friday and uh, did a little bit of renovations and opened up like June 1st. Cool. Wow. Good for you. That's that's very entrepreneurial. Okay. Well, you got your term. What is it? Slacktivism or slacktivist. 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 Someone who goes out there and says, I don't, I'm against whatever, but then they don't do anything. Yeah. That's a good term. Slacktivist or slacktivism. Cool. I will adopt that term. Now that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hashtag, yeah. Hashtag um, slacktivist. Yeah. Let's yeah. get this going. What, uh, where can people get more information about Active Solutions if they're looking for it? And, and easiest way is on the website right now, uh, activesolutionsmedicine.com. Okay. Uh, we're located right downtown Vancouver by Canada Place at West Hastings and Howe. Okay, uh, 744 awesome. West Hastings. Sweet. And then we're on all the social media, Twitter, Facebook. As uh, Active Solutions? Uh, uh, yeah, the Active, Active Solve Med is okay. on Twitter. Active Solve and Med. And cool. my main page is just M. Bennett Med. Okay, M. Bennett Med. Yeah. Okay, cool. So if you're interested in getting uh, your body treated by uh, a holistic practitioner then definitely take advantage of that. I know I will continue going because I'm trying to get this back issue sorted out once and for all and really get back on track with the things I love doing. Because I know when I'm not in my normal r routine and regime of health and fitness, I don't feel the same. I don't work the same. Uh, my sleeping patterns change, you know, just... You know, I don't feel like how I uh, know I can, and that's that's the big difference when people aren't involved with uh, a regular fitness activity. Um, you know, you don't you don't know how good you can feel. Exactly. You know? Yeah, well, so I'm exactly. definitely gonna come visit you for the uh, the food allergy testing. I'm yes. gonna do that. And when you get that prolozone therapy, he can I'm, be number I'll, one. He'll be I will be, I will be there. Yeah, just don't like drill through my hip and like break off a chunk or something. So will you do that actually <laughs> in your uh, studio? You'll be able to do that procedure there. Yeah, we will. Yeah. And is there a special type of tool and drill? Like, how big is the bit? Like, let's it, let's not scare people here. Let's let's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm scared let's be already. real. No, it's uh, it's a little thinner than a than a pencil. Uh, but the, that's pretty big. Yeah. Like the, the sharp end of a pencil or the thick end of the pencil? Uh, towards the sh towards the sharp. Okay, good. It's okay. it's really not that big. Okay. Um, like less than the a actual centimeter? drill is. It, it's just it's an actual like black and decker. It's kind of funny. So they just wow. do, wait. Do they like Home drill Depot. right through your skin, or do they actually puncture the skin and then drill into the bone, or they just get a drill to your leg? And it's like, well, like yeah. So that, no, you you limit pain as much as possible. So. That's good. Uh, you put a topical analgesic on first, yeah. So a topical pain reliever, yeah. And then a local pain reliever where where it will go, and then you you put a guide in with a syringe just to like you said break the skin, takes away some of the nerve pain, and then you'll just use the drill. It t it takes less than a second to get in, and uh, and then you just have you been a, when you go to Chicago to work with this guy. Have yeah. you been able to do it yet? So you're doing it you, with you know him? how to do it. Oh, so you're getting you got lots how, of experience. Uh, how quickly does that Sweet. bone heal? Pretty quickly. There's uh, like I said, everybody walks out, and then um, you're just not supposed to do full impact for about a week or so. Okay, okay. that's super quick. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And then after that, you can start doing your normal activities, even on the joint that was treated. Right. Oh wow! And even now, in the, in the meantime, I encourage you to come by because there's other ways that we can address. Uh, th through acupuncture or through many other modalities to to block pain to b bring blood flow to the knee so that uh, you're just starting to nourish the knee with with more nutrients itself and, and we you can, can you can do that with acupuncture even oh uh, we can yeah really how does that work uh basically you're just taking the needle yeah and then um, you're just tapping it on the bone and Whoa. there's a little bits of uh, small capillaries, small blood vessels, and by tapping it causes bleeding, and then that, that helps to heal the tissue, it helps to strengthen the ligaments, um, helped a few like friends who are chiropractic uh, students, because they're constantly adjusting themselves, or even as a naturopath, we learn manipulations, and you're just constantly causing hypermobility in through the joints right and so you'd always had to kind of crack yourself and, and feel better right but uh it, that's causing a, a laxity in the ligaments 
And so mm. using the acupuncture, you go to both sides of the ligament, you tap it a few times, like a dozen or so, and then that causes micro bleeding. You don't feel it at all, actually, because the innervation, you don't feel anything, and which is great. Yeah. And then it just helps strengthen the, the ligament. That sounds amazing. Well, yeah. I'm definitely going to come in. I'm definitely coming to see you because like, I've been looking for solutions for a long time and I don't really get a lot of great answers sometimes. One thing that kind of bugs me about like certain practitioners is when you'll mention something to them and then they'll say, oh, what about this? And what about that? And they're like, ah, oh, you know, that's no good. And just, just keep coming to me. You know, don't worry about that thing. Don't worry about that new idea. I got yeah. the solution for you right here. There's so many people out there that are just like, it really bugs me when they kind of limit you that way. You know, yeah, because then they're not really projecting their, your your most uh, you know sincere interest of like I just want to get better. I want this healed, yeah. and you know, like yeah, even if the one modality is helping it to some level, is there something else I should be doing? You know, and I wonder how much that like is like is prevalent in like the actual medical medical community. Like they're just like, don't go to these alternative health. We know the answer. You know, or you know, don't they're 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 quacks, whatever they want to call them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wonder if they're just doing it because they're like somewhat threatened in a way, and they're like, well, you know, they, they want to keep your business. Do you have an opinion on that? I have an opinion, yes. You can share it. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, you don't have to. No, no. It is uh, it is quite prevalent. Even uh, I've had some practitioners, uh, like some of my patients have had cancer, and all we were doing was trying to nourish their body better so they could heal from the chemo. And and maintain their immune system mm. because a lot of people will get sick, oh, yeah. and and that's causes a ton of secondary complications. And there's been oncologists who have said, "I'm not going to treat you or to give you chemo or radiation because you're seeing a naturopath." That wow. that's nonsense. That should be illegal, actually. It, well, it is actually, but it yeah. happened. It is quite prevalent. Um, wow. But there is a lot of new doctors and. Uh, European doctors, like all the guys coming over from Germany and Israel and, and Sweden and Switzerland, those guys are incredible. They, they've they embraced the the natural with the pharmaceutical, and, and I think that's the, the practitioner of the future. Of that's I agree. Doing, what's your opinion on, like, you know, you hear so much stuff about, like, pharmaceutical companies and, and like, big pharma and all this kind of thing and how kind of corrupt they are some people would say it's purely corrupt it's all about money and, and big business and they'll they'll actually hold things down like for the example that gets tossed around a lot it's like they're part of the reason why cannabis is still illegal or certain things because they they, they see it as a threat to their business do you would you agree that um i don't know would you agree that, that that's out there like the, like the pharmaceuticals are kind of like or even almost like creating like diseases that don't even really exist so they can like Treat, treat them, you know, and, and put you on some kind of medication. I think it has some truth to it. Uh, I've talked to some very influential executives uh, because right now I'm, I'm in the middle of a patent process and uh, a production process for a supplement for concussions. Uh, myself and another doctor have been developing this for the last uh, two and a half years. Can you go into that before you keep going? Is that like a nootropic kind of thing? Is that what that is? or My supplement? Yeah. Um, it's It basically helps right now to reduce symptoms from a concussion. So it helps limit inflammation in the brain, and it's helping to uh, reduce the symptoms like headaches, uh, mood disorders, sleep disorders, um, so basically, we're helping the body heal faster from concussions. Okay. Is it using like um, whole foods? Uh, nutraceuticals. So nutraceuticals. Yeah. So basically, just uh, uh, di- just different nutrients to um, feed the body. So increase blood flow. Uh, the body's natural antioxidants. Um, just allowing to really empower the body through the healing process. And the study to date so far is at 64 people over the last few years. Everybody's an athlete, and so they have a start date and an end date. It works very well for a study, and uh, it's reducing their symptoms by up to five times. Wow. Hmm. Um, so uh, to your point with the pharmaceutical, we've, we've looked into marketing. We've looked into um, a, a larger company who could buy the patent itself or who could help fund the money to to put our product on the shelves 
and we've had some kind of interesting kind of um, off the cuff conversations, kind of closed door conversations about certain products and and pharma for the uh, for reduction in disease, and uh, it's uh, it's very, it's a, there's a lot of gray out there. Hmm. Let me ask you this then, in your overall opinion, do you trust them, the big pharmaceutical companies? Do you think that they're overall doing a good thing or they or they will do anything they can to turn a profit? No, overall they're doing they're doing well. Yeah. Their their research protocols are are always generally up to standard. Yeah, some people will say not all of them are legit, but in a world today where everything is highly scrutinized, you can find studies to argue any side of any That's medication. Well, and uh, I guess you know one one side of this too is like you know if they are producing legit you know medications for various things now, but a lot of times you know maybe this is a, a, a knock on the Western culture medicine practice is that you know yes let's use let's use these prescriptions to help a symptom. But maybe, and then and then they just leave it at that instead of addressing like, okay, well, what's causing the symptom? What's the root cause of this of whatever it is? Right. And yes, maybe those prescriptions are needed as an acute treatment process for you know dealing with the symptoms. But are we okay? Now let's address the root of that. What's causing it? And I think that's where a lot of things can fall short. Exactly. You know? And 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 doctors, you know, I mean, because you do hear these rumors of. Uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies taking doctors out for lunch and their teams out for lunch and trying to persuade them to use their medication. And just, the, you know, and then so it gets tied into that whole kind of like conspiracy, whether it's true or not. I don't know. I'm not saying either way, but, um, but going back to like, okay, maybe these are being overly used or improperly used in the general practice of medicine. I think some of it was blown up in a few uh, movies and, and media in terms of the pharmaceutical companies taking them out and, and whining and dining them to use it. Yeah. Um, like that movie, Love and Other Drugs. Um, right. it, it's not exactly like that, but uh, uh, they're just trying to, they're, they're trying to run a business. They're just, but they are also doing a lot of research into helping people through their disease process by giving them short-term solutions if you talk to the to the pharmaceutical reps they do still encourage you to take a more holistic approach to to the care of the person um but that's just their their right. business is but ultimately just, it comes down to the medical practitioner to the exactly. doctor yeah and, and what their standpoint is and like you know kind of what really what their beliefs are towards uh, the practice they're executing and to the alternatives that are available. Well, that heard? and the responsibility that the patient itself has to take. They they have to be truthful with themselves too. It's true. Like, we argue yeah. all the time with family members. Oh, well, I'm on this diet or this diet. I'm not losing any weight. Yeah, but I know that you're still eating those chips. <laughs> <laughs> you're still uh, you you scarfing down. Chips, huh? Yeah, chips. You couldn't have said ice cream. Uh, chips, chips, oh chips are my cup tonight for sure. Well, what was uh, I think Rogan was talking about it. I think like um, somewhere. I think it's in Florida that like a huge portion of the population is addicted to painkillers. Like like in pain medicine, it's like a huge business, and like they'll actually have like clinics where doctors will you'll you'll go in to one side of it and they'll prescribe you pain meds, and then you go over the other side and they'll just give them to you. And it's like this crazy this like cycle that they're getting people hooked on like pain medication and things like that. Do, do you think there's like that level of corruption going on there? It, it, I think it was a documentary on it that kind of showed like how how bad it actually was. Do you remember that? Yeah, I don't I don't remember the name of the documentary, but I've definitely heard that. Yeah. Tale before for sure, and uh, I don't. Have you heard anything like that? Or you... I've seen all those like documentaries, and I've I've read about it. Uh, Oxycontin Express is that the one? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, like we have a big problem here in Vancouver with it, just down the street. But right, uh, I can't really speak to that from personal experience. Yeah. Um, so it'd just be speculation, and at this time, yeah. I'd, Rather not speculate. No, I mean that's. I think it's just important to, um, like you said, take personal responsibility of your health, 
uh, question, you know, don't just... Question don't, me. Question yeah, everybody exactly. you encounter. Yeah. And go for that second opinion. Go see a, someone from, coming from a d completely different field from it if you're trying to get something treated because, um, you know, there's, there's definitely more than one way to skin a cat. And uh, when it comes to your health, I think you want to take yeah full responsibility and don't don't just blind faith like oh this guy's an MD and he's going to tell me what I need and let's just leave it at that you know because I think uh, I think the the medicine um, field in general has expanded so far just beyond an MD you know and the GP oh for sure and in medicine knowledge doubles every five years and so it, it's pretty tough to keep up exactly and when you're coming out of the out of schooling where the textbooks and the data is is at least 10 years old you're you're, you're right graduating, behind yeah you're graduating people 15 years behind right yeah. 20 almost 20 years behind of what the actual current data is so mm. right yeah well that's why we need people like yourself to stay on top of the research as it comes out do you do anything like that do you like subscribe to journals or things oh all kinds yeah, yeah. every single morning i start every day i've got about six to seven uh emails i get from journals every morning so cool. i've got these top three studies but every day there's this dozens three more yeah, yeah. exactly and so, so it's, it's ongoing yeah, but, but then uh, that's when you kind of pick through the ones that apply to. Oh, you know what? Ooh, I'm gonna read this and save that for later, and kind of go back to it. Eh? Yeah, and you really. That's why I just always stay focused on what does Active Solutions need? What do my patients need? I'll read what they need, and if and always to be a sponge. Like people coming in with new trends, uh, new ideas, new studies. Yeah. Look at it. Look at it from an objective point of view. Of this is what I've seen. This is what I know. Uh, these are the mechanics behind it. Uh, does it work? Yes, no, let's right. go from there. But at least you're opening up the dialogue. And we all know that anytime there's dialogue, there's going to be progress and totally. there's going to be kinks that are worked out. And it's just a, a medical practice, and that's exactly what it is. So sweet. Well, now I understand. Yeah, and I think that's. A, I understand why you're you're so big on Matt now. Like, yeah, I'm definitely gonna come in to see you. Like, like, I'm, well, I'm, it's, I'm it's, very, like, it's very refreshing to have yeah. someone, um, you know, just being uh, at the level you're at and expressing, um, you know, your opinions and views on things and how you work. And that's why I know we wanted to have you on. And also, as a part of Vancouver Real, it's you know, it's about what's going on locally and and the entrepreneurs that are here and, and what we have to offer. So uh, on that note, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's you. awesome. And we'll do it again in the yeah, future. Yeah, we'll definitely do it again. As things develop. And uh, again, for everyone out there, that's Active Solutions Medicine. Find them online on the website and, uh, and in social media as well. And um, other than that, thank you, Omid, for uh, behind yeah. the scenes, as Cheers. always. Appreciate it. If you All made right. it this far into the podcast, enter the promo code YOGA, and you'll receive a 20% discount off a single float at Float House. There you go, YOGA, 20% off. And with that, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. To right. whatever it is. To whatever it is.